shipping into the delivery business. But there are a few questions. First, is it viable enough uh, for them to make enough money and sustain themselves? Two, what about the price versus quality tightrope for and that's relevant to us, the consumers? Three, is this going to be the new sunrise sector now as far as private equity goes? And four, is the earning going to be ever enough to compensate for the loss in restaurant earnings? These are the questions that we will ask. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the channel of the High Priestess of Hedonism. Today, our pursuit of pleasure is via looking at an exemplary life of a young girl who knew exactly what she wanted from her life and set about it with a lot of zeal, passion, perseverance, and enthusiasm, such that she has grown to become a name to reckon with, a force to reckon with in her chosen field. She has gone about continuously upping her quotient in the game of her profession, such that she's today become a strong woman of substance. And along the way, she has had a lot of fun doing it. Anuti Vishal, my guest for today, is one of India's most respected food and wine writers. She is nationally read columnist who is published constantly in publications in top of the line media such as Times of India, NDTV, The Economic Times, The Hindu, Forbes India, even digital platforms like Scroll.in and Quint. She writes extensively on restaurants, on culinary history, on travel, on trends, on the business of food and wine. She is an important voice and influence in the food and wine industry of India. She is also an author of two hugely successful books. What I really you know, admired about her is her acumen and how she goes about giving insights. She digs out gems from the culinary history, forecasts emerging trends, provides meaningful analysis, and she is such an intrinsic part of the food and wine business. Anuti Vishal, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Karuna. Such kind words, thank you. You have earned every bit of it, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> over the years, built it up, uh, held it, and, and uh, you know, put your flags all over on different milestones. So really, so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you. And it's so special to be here on your show because you're one of those people who saw me um, right at the beginning of my career. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you know, you, you've read me ever since then. Yes. And so it's really, it's a very warm feeling, uh, you know, to be talking to you today. Thank you. I joke with you that I know you from the time you were a cop reporter, right? I mean, it's astonishing, but that is how it is. And, and, you know, 20 years back when I first met you, it was, it was a nice wintry, you know, afternoon in, in the fall of 2000. We had lunch at the Oberoi's very famous Chinese restaurant, Taipan. That's where I was hosting you. And incidentally, that was your first assignment covering food. You know? That's right. Yes. It yeah, that's right. Oh, gosh, 20 years. <laughs> 20 years. That's right. Absolutely amazing. So tell me, Anuti, how has your journey been since then? You know, I, uh, Aruna, I did not set out to be a food writer. So it was quite uh, by chance, by fluke, by a fluke that I actually started doing that. And at that point, I didn't realize that I would enjoy it so much. Uh, so it's been a very fulfilling journey. And um, I've grown to love uh, what I do. I'm really invested in, uh, you know, food and beverage in India and also how Indian food is perceived globally. You know, so I feel very passionately about it. And, and it's something, uh, you know, that's become much more than just work for me. You know, it's almost become a mission. That's right. Absolutely. So what, what did you really want to become when you were, when you, were you know, um, starting off in journalism? Well, you know, I mean, like all journalists uh, at that time, this is 20 years ago when, uh, you know, print was in its heyday. Yes. Um, I wanted to do more serious stuff. 
so, uh, you know, when I interned, I interned on some news desks and, you know, where I was doing actually page one copies and I was uh, uh, doing, you know, stuff on international relations, on business and, um, and, you know, in college, when I was in college, I'd always thought that I wanted to uh, be a critic, but be an art critic. Um, write on things like gender, which uh, because I studied at Lady Shri Ram, you know, that was something that we, we you know, we looked uh, at a lot of things through that lens and that was something that I was trained to do. So, you know, I really thought that when I uh, became a full-time journalist, that is what I would be writing on and food really was, you know, it was just, there were no restaurants in the country. So, of course, you know, we did go out, but it was a very special occasion sort of dining. It was, uh, our lifestyles really were completely different from our lifestyles today, where all of us, you know, usually dine out, say, three times a week. That's the national average now. Um, and at that time, it was, you know, if you dined out once a month, that would be Only great. And you were very That's right. Yes. 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 So, um, uh, you know, so, so. Really, I mean, I didn't think on, in terms of uh, writing on food at all. Um, but I'm glad I started out then and I'm glad I got the opportunity to do uh, this then because it was really a very decisive moment for restaurants and food in India. And I just happened to be there at the right time. So, so it just turned out quite well. Absolutely. And, and look where food writing has come to, you know, and food and beverage as a business per se so important, you know, and so sort Absolutely. of, you know, and so strategic, so it, it, it is a serious line of profession now. I mean, at one time, you might have thought that it's really on the surface, it's really the fluff and the, and the, and the you know, uh, it's just like candy floss, you know, that is what I thought about my profession as well, when I was starting off in PR and communications, you know, yeah. uh, initially, when it was very serious, and it was hardcore, because I came from a very, I was trained very well in, in PR and communications and brand management in my Australian High Commission days. But when I got on the hotels, people thought it was very sort of, you know, really all about whining and dining. But soon I realized that yeah. Yeah. it was really serious work. You had to get down on your knees, you know, you had to get your hands dirty. And, and still at the same time, you know, straighten up your sari, get up and, and look pretty and, and dine and wine as well. But a whole lot of serious work. And I guess in your area also, you've really gone on to, you know, look at defining trends, forecasting trends. Uh, treating food and business as an important industry that it has become today, you know. Exactly. And, you know, and important exports and imports that it sort of, you know, has integrity, you know, uh, entrenched in, in its sort of womb. So a very, very important business and very important line of work. And you see, uh, yeah. food or wine or travel or both, really. So I'm happy you could exactly. be also happy. No, you know, when... Yes, when, when, when I began, uh, my boss used to say that this is half a beat. So she expected actually a lot more work because she was like, oh, you know, this is so non-serious. This is just half a beat. But actually, um, I did look at it pretty seriously right from the beginning. And uh, you're right because now, you know, when you see it and when we look at it from the lens of a post-liberalization business, it's one of those businesses that's not just, you know, there was this, uh, of course, this year has been unfortunate for the industry, but uh, before this, it's one of those post-liberalization businesses that's boomed completely along with um, other retail in India. And um, it's important socially as well, because it's just become, you know, so much a part of who we are as a people. Okay. Um, so, but we'll talk more about it. I'm yes. sure you'll yes. ask and me more about it. You know, you, and you've never, uh, even if your uh, boss said it was half a beat, from the time I've known you and I've sort of seen you work and, you know, read your work, you've never treated it as half a beat. You gave it your full on, you gave it your, you know, 100%. And you really brought that seriousness to the way you talk yeah. about food or covered restaurants, even if you covered a, you know, a small food festival, you really brought a lot of uh, sincerity and I guess seriousness to it, you know, and respect for your field, for your beat. And that really shone through from the very beginning, Anuti. I must say that, you know, and that, that, that's something that really stands apart about you. Uh, when, when Thank you. Started. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank and you know, you. I'm also of the contention, Anuti, with the pandemic and everything, 
you know, I think food and wine business is something which will for everybody is facing an economic downturn. Uh, things are not doing very well for the world over. People are, you know, targeting or forecasting dates of 2021 to 2024 when travel and a lot of other industries will begin to sort of, you know, uh, bolster and come back. But I feel because people will not stop to entertain themselves and bring a lot of, you know, a sucker in their own lives, they will not stop eating and drinking. And yeah. it would probably yeah. be that food and wine business will uh, will bring back the economy on the on the even rate much before other industries begin to, because that's yeah. how yeah. the human spirit is, you know. We would want to exactly. do, isn't it? Uh, is that is that what exactly. you think well? It would be a very yes, good so. our recovery. Yes, because, uh, you know, if you see the last one month or last two months, um, actually, you know, now when you see hospitality, uh, there are resorts which are full completely till uh, mid-December, you know, at least on weekends. Sure. There are restaurants which are, uh, again, uh, you know, going uh, completely full destinations like Goa, where everyone is headed. So actually, business is bouncing back. I mean, I was talking to a couple of these wine retail stores. And um, uh, though, you know, institutional business has been bad for everyone in the liquor industry, for instance, um, uh, you know, but because retail has been so strong, they've actually been able to match last year's figures. So when, of course, you know, this entire uh, industry of food and beverage was devastated uh, during the lockdowns, during various lockdowns but in the last two months already we are seeing a huge recovery and uh, you know I foresee uh, it coming back very very soon in uh, 2021 because you know you're like you are saying that essentially to be human is to be social Absolutely. after all I mean of course right now we all are within our homes I I'm not stepping out personally and of course you know there are fears, there's apprehension, and rightly so. I mean, all of us need to be cautious. Um, however, there is also this need uh, to be more social, to meet people, to connect with them. And uh, there's no better way than to do it uh, over dining, over, you know, sharing something. Quite right. So it will... Really yeah, and, and people are trying all ways and means to get back, even, even people on the other side of the fence providing service. For example, uh, Ritu Dalmia had begun her do-it-yourself kits, which we, she was sending out to people who wanted to, you know, have a taste of her menu. Uh, isn't that right? I mean, you, you must have seen several such things coming up. <laughs> you know, there has been so much astonishing innovation in this field uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, you just actually get to see that when there is necessity, how do human beings innovate? Right. And, you know, this is uh, really, you know, a first class example of that because the entire industry was devastated. People couldn't really go out to restaurants. So actually restaurants started coming into your home. Yes. And um, so many chefs, Almost all restaurants, of course, have been doing home deliveries. And uh, with the result that home delivery was a segment, you know, which was very low quality in India uh, till before this. And it also obviously also commanded prices which were like that. But actually the entire segment has been lifted because of so many um, serious brands, so many serious restaurants, chefs all getting into the game. And uh, then there are these innovative concepts like these DIY kits. Very young people have launched, uh, you know, several different businesses during this pandemic. So it's astonishing, you know. I mean, I'm just sometimes um, overwhelmed absolutely by the kind of innovation which is happening in this space uh, in these very trying times. Absolutely, absolutely. Going back to your uh, your path, your career path, Aduti, you have, you know, assiduously built up your reputation as one of the most credible voices, um, you know, one of the most credible food critics that India has known. As a matter of fact, you are today considered amongst the top food and wine writers. Uh, what has really gone into this building process? How, how have you gone about doing that? First of all, thank you. And again, you know, um, it's very special coming from you when I hear these words. Thank you. Um, <laughs> two, I don't think it was a very conscious 
process, you know, on my part, because I think, uh, you know, the way I function uh, as a person is also, uh, you know, very instinctively. Uh, so, I mean, of course, you know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a writer. I knew that always. Uh, and when I got into a journal, uh, you know, into journalism and into a newspaper office, um, it was under the misapprehension that I would be a writer. Journalists are not writers, you know. I mean, being a writer is completely different from being a journalist. But at that age and at that stage, I thought this is what being a writer meant. So I always wanted to do that. And I suppose because that was something that was intrinsic to me always. Um, when you say that, you know, I approached my work in a certain way, Correct. I did approach it, uh, you know, from that point of view, from being a serious writer, it doesn't matter what you're writing about. I mean, and of course, food is very engaging. It's very entertaining. You know, there are so many stories to be told. Um, so I always approached it like that. Um, and of course, my, the places, just the variety of places that I worked at, um, and I had the opportunity of working at, you know, business papers. Uh, I, I've never worked really in uh, lifestyle magazines. You know, I've only worked in very serious, uh, not that lifestyle magazines are not serious or oh. cannot be serious. <laughs> I don't mean to say that. <laughs> but, you know, I've worked in business papers and in yeah. newspapers where you're competing with um, many other bigger businesses. So when you're writing about something like that, you're actually measuring yourself not against, um, you know, some other food copy, but against uh, something else, which may be aviation, retail, medicine, um, uh, you know, or something which is breaking news. And then your copy has to be good enough to measure against all of that to be carried in the papers. I suppose that that helped. Absolutely. You know, what you said just now reminds me of a very funny... Uh, seen from the Devil Wears Prada when Anne Hathaway's character is very sort of, you know, she's very condescending towards fashion and all that, you know, hoopla that's been created around <laughs> picking up the right dress and the belt and, you know, the two same kind of belts are shown to Meryl Streep sort of, you know, um, uh, performing uh, Anna Wintour in, in, on screen. And she says, oh, this one's better, though both of them are like, so Anne, Anne Hathaway, you know, bursts out. And Meryl Streep turns around and says, you know, you think that's funny and that's not serious. And she gives her a big tirade on what fashion industry, how serious it is. So, you know, what you said about lifestyle, that's very serious too, you know. Um, so <laughs> you know of course, of course, absolutely. Except that, you know, when you're writing for a, a publication that specializes yes. in lifestyle, yes. there are dedicated spaces for you. But, you yes. know, for somebody like me who worked uh, in always in, uh, you know, newspapers and in uh, business papers, I had to fight for that space, which meant that you automatically treated food at par with whatever conventionally was thought to be hard news or, uh, you know, more important, though, I mean, that's obviously a way of looking at things. Um, but, you know, something basic like roti kapra and makan uh, versus fancy restaurant dining, uh, you know, I mean, you, you still had to fight for space and um, have your say in those that's papers. Right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yes, true. And Anuti, in today's world of, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, you are indeed one of the fair and frank voices. You have never shied away from calling a spade a spade. I know that, you know, for sure. You, 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 even at the you know, expense of being called blunt, you, you, will, you will say what it is and how it is. How do you choose to remain so honest and sincere in this people-centric industry with, with its fat egos and, you know, fancy facades? How do you manage to do that? Aruna, before your interview, I have coached myself not to blurt out things and not to put my foot in the mouth. <laughs> but uh, again, you know, I think this is something which is uh, intrinsic, perhaps, you know, to the way I am. And also, I've never tried to consciously uh, curb it, you know, because instinctively, I will tell you, I'm unable sometimes to really um, couch things in a, 
in a nice uh, way of uh, you know saying things or you know whatever or, or speaking untruths i'm really uncomfortable it shows um so intrinsically th- there's that but then to um i've also not tried to uh, actually curb that you know something which was already there so yes. i never felt the need to i don't know yeah you know, i'm still it, trying to analyze myself so with you people will think that you know um, I, i'm saying a lot about you because i know you and i, I can I, i have seen it so i can say that with a lot of conviction with you it's not been about being blunt or putting foot in your mouth you have you know have cultivated not even a formidable repetition for this is a wrong word but a respectful repetition that you will say what is uh, the the situation as is you know uh, how things are without really sugar coating it or making it fancy and making it you know really unreal uh, and, and in spite of you know you'll have good relationships yet you will you know manage to uh, give an yeah. honest uh, review or analysis or update or coverage of what you are you know uh, of the work at hand or of the idea at hand or of the of the of the you know uh, aspect at hand and that that is what has stood out about you Uh, see you know that a lot of that is just sheer journalistic training you know when people ask me that i find it strange sometimes because any journalist would do the same thing when you know at least that was the old fashioned journalist when you were meant to be the voice of your reader you know you were writing for your for your dedicated reader uh and you were obliged to actually tell your reader the correct picture vis-a-vis you know or versus somebody who is in the marketing department of a brand so i am not a marketing person you know when i'm when i'm talking about something uh you know in many ways our roles were you know quite the opposite because you you know when you were with hotels etc you represented a certain brand and therefore you were the voice of the brand however uh you know i was obliged to say things the way i saw them yes. um you know for my readers so i was never obliged to actually sugarcoat things or say things which were more than um you know what they were uh, because then i would be dishonest to my reader and this is something you know which is intrinsic to journalism as it used to be now things have changed obviously quite a bit yeah. and a lot of people on social media sometimes don't even understand this you know because now we are living in a completely different world and this yeah. is a world of influencers etc and this is that whole distinguishing factor you know who are you writing for who is your audience which is what you know a lot of writers influencers don't understand right now but uh, this is something which was intrinsic to our training absolutely uh, being the way you have been and you know having spoken your mind rightly so not shot from the hip but rightly so has it impacted your business relationships in some ways as well have you seen that happening no i don't think so you know because um, i i really believe now and you know this is after a lot of introspection i know that your intent matters the other person is smart enough to see where you're coming from and why are you saying something uh, you know so if i'm actually giving uh, my honest opinion or my feedback on something as i see it people who are really bothered about their product about their restaurant about their food will acknowledge it we'll see it for what it is now what they do with it is entirely up to them you know because it's their business at the end of the day however uh, you know they they will be receptive to it um if they feel if they trust me you know first of all if they trust me uh with having a fair uh, you know sort of a um intention yes. you know why am i saying those things is it is it uh, because i'm motivated by something or uh, is it because i genuinely believe it and if i genuinely believe it then am i competent enough to be uh, putting that out and how seriously then should they take my word for it and i think that's true for any reviewer anywhere you know when you're critiquing something of course it's very subjective uh, and it's really up to your audience and to people who make that product uh, to take your word uh, how seriously they want it 
but at the end of the day they do so because um, they have faith in you and uh, they have faith in you because you know they know that you're coming from the right place and your your intention is correct uh, and two that uh, you know you're you're competent and capable enough to be commenting on whatever they are doing absolutely so really the bottom line is to you know uh, create a credible voice a credible sort of you yeah. know a space for yourself and uh, and and also you know come across as not just come across but be extremely competent in your in your uh, in your area of work such that the person in front of you people who you work with you know will uh, trust you in what you say and how you say and uh, uh, and, and what you have to really say, isn't it? Uh, that, that's that's really it boils exactly. down to that bottom line. Exactly, and that's credibility. At the end of the day, that is how you know that is how you Absolutely. develop your credibility. Correct, 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 so. correct. Absolutely, very well said. You know, uh, I'm going to take you to your previous answer. I think that's very important from today's uh, point of view as well, and with, with with how dynamic the media is, and how sort of you know um, uh, solvent the whole situation is, you know, and how how people work with media and how the media works with situation. Um, you talked about journalistic ethics. How would you define journalistic ethics, you know, from the long standing point of view and how should they be now? Gosh, you know, now this is just way too complicated today, uh, like, you know, uh, because, you know, I mean, uh, media is in a state of now, and I'm going to be very forthright and very blunt uh, now that you've set the tone for it. Uh, media is in a state of decline, sadly, um, all over the world. This is in many ways. Also, I see it as the age of, uh, you know, an age where, where knowledge is really not valued that much. Is it disinformation, Anuti? It's the age of disinformation yes. for sure. Yes. Uh, but, you know, with fake news everywhere and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, what social media also does is, uh, you know, see, it's the age of uh, the, how do I say it, the, the unexpert. Yes. You know, yes. what social media does is it brings down uh, the voice of an expert yes. uh, to be at par with the voice of anyone so in one way of course it's democratized everything you know we don't have uh, gatekeepers to information or knowledge but on the other hand there is therefore uh, no trust and uh, no no uh, validation or stature for an uh, expert voice yes so and people are confused. They don't really know what to listen to. So right. we are in quite a mess, very honestly speaking. And therefore, you know, the ethics are all in a mess and in a very tumultuous state right now. And everyone's defining them uh, according to who they are as individuals, you know, especially um, on social media. You know, I sometimes get so many queries uh, from uh, people who style themselves and as influencers and they gen genuinely want to know you know I've got uh, questions like you know when, when people uh, have actually said that if uh, I'm posting about somebody's food uh, restaurant's food why should I do it for free and why should they not pay me for it um, and they, they actually want to be guided on how to navigate this because they've styled themselves as influencers. They clearly want to monetize their influence, uh, but they don't know what is ethical and what is unethical behavior. Quite right. And, uh, uh, you know, so, I mean, some, some people have asked me this and I've told them that as I see it, I think, you know, they need to, they, if they want to monetize it, sure. You know, I mean, I think that's how the world is evolving. The, media is evolving. However, I think they do owe it to their uh, audience to then uh, define, you know, themselves uh, as who they are. And if this is something which is paid for, then they need to make it clear, even in their social media posts, so that the other person knows, Absolutely. you know. Uh, how finely said, that's right. And, you know, yeah. I, I have put back uh, on my rose-tinted glasses with the onset of the pandemic, you know, and I somehow am feeling very optimistic and I'm of the belief that the old values will come back. 
you know, in the way we think, in the way we lead our lives, in the way we work, and, and the old work values will, you know, begin to come back too. Is that how you see things happening? Because it's all a wheel. Life is really a wheel, isn't it? Do it you is. think that's going to come back? Will, will yeah, it come it's back? the circle of... It's a circle of life, so it has to come back. The question is when, we yes. don't know. But uh, till that time, I think the only thing we can do is to, to live by what we think is correct. Absolutely. And, you know, that's really, that's the only thing we control. Yes. Uh, to live by our own set of values and define them for ourselves. And so there's nothing else to it. So true, so true. And no conversation with you is going to be ever complete without talking about the PR side of things, you know, we, we, we've spoken about that, but I, I must bring it to this table as well. <laughs> what, what do you think, how should the PR people behave? What do you think is the right way of, you know, doing public relations? How should people be good brand ambassadors as well? From, from your point of view, from, from somebody who's on the other side of the fence and, and watching and working with, with this set of people. Listen, I mean, you know, you should answer that no. because you should actually, your, now your plan, uh, if I may say so, should be to actually open a school you and, uh, <laughs> you know, teach people how to, uh, you know, be really top of the line professionals, which you were, Aruna, and you know that I've always thought that, um, you know, I think there has to be a certain gravitas first. Um, in anything that you do, you know, you need to respect your work and uh, you need to take your work seriously. And that is something, you know, sometimes very young professionals, you know, whether they are journalists, writers, influencers, or PR people, uh, sometimes they don't understand that and sometimes they forget it or they're not trained to see it like that. Okay. So I think that's very important. The moment they start you know, doing that, the moment their perspective becomes like that, I think everything falls into place. Uh, if you respect your work, yes. the other person is likely to respect your work and is likely to respect you. Um, so, you know, in whichever field you are, whether you are uh, on this side of the fence or that side of the fence. And I think that's something that uh, people should be trained in, you know, trained to think like that and to value the work you're doing because PR, of course, is so important and it's more valuable today than That's it right. ever was yes. it's also evolved so much you know it's not just about whining and dining like you know uh, what we used to think hotel pr was but it's so much more it's brand strategy it's it's crisis management crisis it's everything management. That's right. yes. so important yes. so um i think people need to see it for what it is and first especially you know people who are entering this field need to believe in that and only then can the other people uh, truly take it seriously. Correct, correct, absolutely, that's right. And you know, Anuti, I had, I can say from personal experience, I've been noticing it. I've been sort of, you know, I have, I have uh, first-hand knowledge about it. That your writing style has, you know, really uh, evolved to be very fine and mature over the years, such that you know it is at par with what you see in Bon Appetit or Sever or Wine and Spirits internationally. How have you been, you know, refining your craft and making it stand head and shoulders above most that exists in India today? How have you been doing that? Wow, wow. I was saying this publicly, so that's excellent. <laughs> For record, you know. <laughs> On record today. <laughs> Thank you. So um, you know, Aruna, the thing is that, like I said, uh, I've always wanted to be a writer. However, I don't think you can be a, a great writer uh, without experience. You know, you have to live your life a little bit and then it starts showing in anything, any piece of writing that you're doing. And I think that seems to perhaps have happened even with my food writing. Yes. Uh, it's, it's just a natural evolution. Uh, one uh, evolution not just in terms of style because you know there's the technique of writing and the style yes. of writing yes. which is one thing but there's also what are you saying you know I think for writing what uh, a lot of people don't understand is that it's not only about uh, it's not just stylistic but it's also how you are thinking uh, so the hardest part of writing is actually thinking 
you know sometimes you may just be doing nothing but you're mulling over something and uh, you know your perspective what is your philosophy all of that is so important and it's perhaps just that natural evolution that you've been seeing um which comes you know uh, as as you grow as you grow up as uh, you know you you've lived your life a little bit more there's more exposure you're able to see many different things um also a lot of people ask me this so i'm glad you asked me actually that this question because um i want to also you know tell people who want to write on food that uh, when they are reading something i think it doesn't have to be about food um any knowledge that you gain you know whether it's about history uh, whether it is about literature culture all of that translates into how you're writing about your own subject and um, i think over a period of time you tend to gain more knowledge like that because you know you're constantly reading more you're constantly meeting more people yeah. um so you know in general uh, you have a perspective on 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 a much larger uh, you know sort of a milieu rather than only food fabulous. and that comes across in your food writing as well fabulous fabulous you know this is exactly what shabana asli once said you know i saw one of her old interviews and somebody was asking her how do you become a good you know actor and she says it's yeah. not just by you know practicing your craft of acting it is also by developing a whole lot of interest in in a large plethora of things you know go out watch theater go to a museum yeah. learn listen to music you know read a lot uh, observe life and that's how you it will all sort of you know seep into how you yeah. work yourself so and and, and you're the one very one of the few people or maybe the only person to have said a new added a new dimension to it you know when you said that to really evolve your craft you have been practicing thinking you know that that's so important you know to <laughs> yeah you have to of think of course yeah. absolutely fantastic yeah no you just say say something else about that you know about how to internalize what you you know read and how to sort of you know let that sort of you know get imbibed within so Uh, so you have a fantastic you know a fabulous output that comes out so that that was a new dimension really a new thing yeah thank you and i really believe in that because yeah. uh, you know whether it's an article that i do uh, uh, now i'm i'm going to share this it's very personal yes. but yes. Uh, you know perhaps it may be helpful for somebody who's watching this a lot of times you know what i do is uh, when i'm writing even a food article even a, like a regular thing um, i collect my information but then i don't immediately write it you know deadline permitting right. um i just let it it's almost like you know uh, letting something uh, soak in a spirit or whatever and you know i so i just let it be for a while and uh, then i just you know I, at least overnight and then i write it the next morning because uh, it it just is very important i don't know what it is but i think it's very very important to just let all your thoughts come together and then figure out what is the approach you are going to take and also you know then the structure of your copy all of that uh, becomes very important fabulous fabulous a very fine thing to say like i said you are you know one of the first few people who also who mentioned that you know the aspect of really sitting back and really being with your thoughts uh, you know letting it you know toss and turn in your mind and uh, bringing you know in a lot of your influences to sort of you know mesh and blend with your thought process and then yeah. you know bring, bring bring up something unique and something valuable and something absolutely you know uh, fantastic that people love to read and and sort of you know Uh, hold you with so yeah fantastic really so anuti tell me you know i i i am doing this show also for a lot of young people the millennial and hopefully wanting to leave you know important lessons for people to pick up on and and really uh, have have the you know motion set you know on so that you know uh, the energy is uh, caught on by somebody and sort of used effectively by them in their life as well that that's the basic intention too so tell me how can the young aspirants learn to be uh, a food and wine writer you know how does one become a successful food writer what is the template for it 
gosh that's just such a tough question aruna because i don't know what to say to this now obviously you know the first thing is that you have to be interested in what you are doing yes. and today also the field is so much you know it's so much more cluttered there are so many more people who are doing this uh, so you have to find uh, you know your own unique voice what is it that uh, how are you viewing food what is it that is unique about you and your perspective um on food you know so you have to figure that out i suppose and then to also uh, you know see we had when when i started writing on food i had the luxury of time uh, to sort of you know evolve uh, with the evolving food scene in india and um, uh, you know just to know uh, about things but today i don't think people have that luxury because uh, again it's such a competitive space so i think a little bit of training in food per se is very important where you know you're able to at least uh, see the technical side of it and you know you have a certain degree of exposure which we didn't have because you know nothing existed in india at that time um so you know we had very little ex- exposure i mean apart from what we ate at home and uh, some of us were fortunate to have grown up in families that placed a lot of emphasis on fine food uh, but today perhaps it's important to also have uh, a little bit of you know formal knowledge uh, on food per se and then pursue this yes yes you know uh, in my hotel years also i had some friends from the media who were really seriously interested in writing about food who would request me to you know get them the orders for the chef and come right into the kitchen you know and see how things were being done yeah. or, or go to yeah. the uh, go to the you know the landing bay and see how what kind of produce had you know arrived and what was the hotel dealing with so that that acute level of interest is important as what you're saying as well isn't it to to really know exactly the yeah Yeah, exactly because uh, see anyway you know if you're truly interested in it beyond just uh, you know what it does for you you know whether you can monetize it or not uh, but if you're genuinely interested in it you are going to see all sides of it how is it produced uh, uh, what is the you know the uh, the artistry uh, required to produce it what is the economics of it what are the social implications of it right. so uh, and the more you research that the better you get absolutely. Uh, so absolutely very well so and is reading important to reading people like you people people you know uh, who have made a name for themselves as food writers should that uh, should the young aspirants not be doing that as well you know well i hope they read me i'm always looking for readers all all writers live and they say we you know we don't write for an audience of course we want an audience you know so uh, it's it's great to have an audience um sure you know read other writers on food but like i said read other things as well uh, don't just read food you know i mean personally i don't read uh, <laughs> sorry but i don't really read too much writing on food because i feel you know i mean i'd like my own original perspective and that sometimes um, you know things may my voice may get stale if i read uh, so, someone else too much uh, so you know i mean i always find it more valuable to read other things other than food but yeah. that just could be something very personal to me yeah. Uh, yeah. so sure i mean it's it's also a process of trial and error and uh, reading is opening new worlds and people should definitely do that ladies and gentlemen that is the marvelous mrs vishal for you she speaks a mind she calls a spade a spade she has built quite the reputation for herself in the industry but a reputation that is based on a lot of hard work a lot of research a lot of honesty and integrity and whatever she says she backs it up with some strong facts so much that you know her voice is a very strong voice to reckon with restaurateurs look up to her seek her counsel the normal you know food and wine loving gentry like you and me want to know what she has to say about the industry at large um what is she going to recommend what does she have to say about a certain uh, food fad uh how does she write about it what is she going to write about it um what is she going to say about you know 
things that we want to um, enjoy ourselves with. Um, she is truly one of the most important food and wine writers in the country today. I have known her for donkey's years and she has always remained so delightful, so grounded, so earthy and really such a, uh, you know, a strong base of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, what a fantastic conversation with Danuti Vishal, but we can't let it go just yet. There's so much more to talk to her about and we will pull her back in the next episode too. Before you go away, I request you to, if you're liking what we're doing over here on this channel, I request you to like, share and subscribe to the channel of the High Priestess of Hedonism for a lot more wonderful content, for a lot more um, energy inducing, thought provoking, um, fun um, um, sort of, you know, um, um, engagement, conversations, interactions. I'll see you then. Bye for now.